Happy Monday, listeners. Welcome to the Religious Studies Project. I'm Dave McConaughey, and with me today is... Ray Fallon. And today we have a wonderful episode. I have been dying to interview uh, Jay Laran Matori of Duke University on his book, The Fetish Revisited. And the first half of the episode is definitely about that book, but then we move on to Matori's more recent work on BDSM. So just letting you know that that is coming up in this episode. It is a fabulous one, so I hope you enjoy it. Take it away. Thank you. And I'm very excited to have with me Professor J. Laurent Matori. J. Laurent Matori is the Lawrence Richardson Professor of Cultural Anthropology and the Director of the Sacred Arts of the Black Atlantic Project at Duke University. The author of four books and more than 50 articles and reviews, he is also the executive producer and screenwriter of five documentary films. Choice Magazine named his Sex and the Empire That Is No More, Gender and the Politics of Metaphor in Oyo Yoruba Religion, an outstanding book of the year in 1994. And his Black Atlantic Religion, Tradition, Transnationalism and Matriarchy in the Afro-Brazilian Candomblé won the Hertzkowitz Prize for the African Studies Association for the Best Book of 2005. In 2003, the President of the United States appointed Professor Matori to the Presidential Advisory Committee on Cultural Property at the U.S. Department of State, where he served until 2011. In 2010, he received the Distinguished Africanist Award from the American Anthropological Association, and in 2003, the government of the Federal Republic Republic of Germany awarded him the Alexander von Humboldt Prize, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and year-long residential fellowship that is one of Europe's highest academic distinctions. Professor Matori was also selected to deliver anthropology's most prestigious annual address, the Lewis Henry Morgan Lecture, which resulted in the book Stigma and Culture, Last Place Anxiety in Black America, published in 2015. It concerned the competitive and hierarchical nature of ethnic identity formation. His latest book, The Fetish Revisited, Marx, Freud and the Gods Black People Make, was published in 2018 and won the American Academy of Religion's 2019 prize for the excellence in the study of religion in the analytical descriptive studies category. Professor Matori is a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Chicago and was a tenured full professor at Harvard University until moving to Duke in 2009. He has produced 37 years of intensive research and on the great religions of the Black Atlantic, West African Yoruba religion, West Central African Congo religion, Brazilian Candomblé, Cuban Santeria Oka, and Haitian Vodou. In recognition of his outstanding scholarship, he also served from 2019 to 2013 as the James P. Marsh, Pro- Marsh Professor at large at the University of Vermont, one of that university's highest honours. In conjunction with the university's Fleming Museum of Art, he curated in fall 2017 a major museum exhibition on the topic of his latest book. The exhibition is titled Spirited Things, Sacred Art for the Black Atlantic, and it will be touring nationally and internationally in 2020. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Fallon. (laughs) Now, we are going to talk about a lot of uh, your work, I guess, over the last sort of five years, but I'd like to start with, with your most recent book, The Fetish Revisited. It considers what I would call a controversial theory, um, the one of fetishism. Um, but before we dive into what your book's main argument is, I was wondering if you could give us an overview of the concept of fetishism and how it came about. Very good. Uh, The concept of fetishism is fundamentally the accusation that a certain action or object has been uh, assigned uh, assigned value improperly, has been assigned excessive value, or has wrongly had agency or uh, power attributed to it. Um, The classical referent of this term is the gods of Egypt and other parts of Africa, whom Enlightenment thinkers uh, thought had been credited with powers that they did not have uh, and with value that they lacked. Um, It has subsequently become a major metaphor in European social criticism, especially since the Enlightenment, whereby one European or Westerner accuses another Westerner or European of uh, wrongly attributing a value to certain to a certain object or wrongly crediting with it with agents with agency after the manner of those ostensibly foolish Africans. And in terms of this um, 
Westerners accusing other Westerners. I'm assuming you're referring to Marx and Freud there? Yes, Marx, Freud, Hegel, the list is endless. Fet- the concept of fetishism remains a very important element of especially Marxist-inspired criticism of, uh, of, of capitalism's false attribution of value to commodities, of, uh, of, of dictatorial governments' false attribution of value to large imposing buildings, uh, and uh, even in uh, psychoanalysis of people... Uh, crediting objects that they shouldn't be aroused by with the power to arouse, with uh, sexual content. Um, so that's, uh, that's really, it's, it's really quite, quite central to the- conversations around social theory in the West these days, and particularly uh, amid the influence of Marxism and psychoanalysis. Would we say, though, that the fetish really started more as a, a colonial endeavor with, you know, white colonials naming the practices or, or beliefs of, of people of color? Exactly. That's that's a critical moment. Um, let me go back a little bit farther, though. The term fetish, or its Portuguese uh, etymological root, fechisu, uh, was a uh, 15th and 16th century reference during the, uh, during the Inquisition to certain um, consecrated objects being used by female healers, for the most part, to cure their patients and uh, other supplicants in Portuguese society. Um, uh, Roman Catholic inquisitors regarded this as a form of crime, as a, a uh, an, an inappropriate uh, use of of the sacred and an inappropriate attribution of value and power to objects. So these women were persecuted for it. Soon thereafter, Portuguese mariners who visited the West African coast and engaged in disputes with West Africans about the value of the goods that the Portuguese were selling and the value of the goods that the Africans were selling and so forth, um, uh, these Portuguese mariners accused the Africans of fetishism for what they thought was overvaluing certain goods and undervaluing certain goods and attributing powers to objects that Africans regarded as sacred, and the Portuguese mariners did not. Uh, Over the next few centuries, Dutch mariners also visited the West African coast and ended up accusing not only uh, African priests and traders with attributing value and agency wrongly to objects, but also accused the Portuguese themselves of attributing value and agency wrongly to objects. It was part of a Dutch Protestant critique of Roman Catholicism because, as everybody knows, the Catholics are really great at, at, at creating and assembling gorgeous objects to manifest the power of their god. But this was anathema to Northern European uh, Protestantism. So to analogize uh, one's European trade rivals and European religious rivals to Africans was a, 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 a competitive rhetoric. And they used the term fetishism to, uh, in, this, in this criticism. Uh, amid the Enlightenment, uh, various uh, various thinkers, uh, such as Charles de Ross, borrowed this term to uh, to criticize European social forms, such as European royalty and aristocracy, uh, the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy, and its forms of power and worship. Whoop, those were criticized as forms of fetishism. Again, uh, ostensibly analogously to what all all Europeans. Uh, these European intellectuals seem to agree was the uh, definitive foolishness of Africans. By the late 19th century, yes, this this term was reappropriated in the analysis of what made Europe ostensibly different from the rest of the world, uh, carrying with it the assumption that there was something uniquely right, uniquely true about European materialism, European monotheism, and and definitionally wrong about the attribution of agency, value, and souls to trees, to stones, to rivers, to the ocean, and so forth. And uh, and so to this very day, uh, many scholars uh, bring to the analysis of the world the sense that uh, human beings are uniquely conscious, um, human creations and nature are uniquely material, and uh, and that uh, and that the things that we create and the uh, non-human animals, rivers, trees, oceans around us are a categorically different type of 
of entity or thing that lacks agency and whose value is determined by people. Um, that's based, That's the foundation of our current society, I think, in, uh, except for the most religious of people. Um, and uh, it contrasts sharply with a set of ways of thinking uh, in the Afro-Atlantic world and really much of the world generally in South Asia um, uh, provides numerous examples in which uh, people are understood to be uh, products of many forces within the universe and not merely autonomous individuals. And likewise, rivers, trees, plants, the air upon which we depend for our very existence are agents of their own and have forms of value that are autonomous from what, what use human beings put them to. Um, and those ways of thinking are regularly criticized by those of us who, who embrace uh, fully the message of the Enlightenment um, as somehow foolish and not recognizing a truth that we Enlightenment-influenced thinkers do recognize. Now, your book, it offers a rethinking of fetishism, uh, so much so as to say that it it critiques the very way we think about social theories that's sort of self-existent. And we often work with them without sort of placing them in the context from which they they originally stemmed. Sure. In in scrutinizing the, the context of fetishism in the book, what do you want to illuminate for the reader about fetishism and about social theories? Very good. Okay, so so most fundamentally, I'm arguing that um when a European social theorist or a contemporary social critic calls someone else's behavior, thought, or possessions fetishes, he or she assumes that the speaker knows what real value is and where agency really belongs. It's a very self-righteous accusation, even when leveled by left-wing critics of capitalism or, or what have you. Um, but what I'm pointing out is that uh, the fact that somebody calls something a fetish is not diagnostic of the speaker's correctness or of the correctness of the speaker's sense of where what real value is and where agency really belongs. It's really diagnostic of a disagreement between two parties about the value of an object and a disagreement between two parties about who deserves the credit for the value of that object or who deserves the credit for what is done with that object. Are you with me so far? Yep, definitely with you. Oh, okay, so I find this particular trope fascinating to think by. That is, in in a globalized world, in a local world, in a world between hierarchically arranged partners in any given relationship, there is always disagreement about the value of the objects uh, that help their relationship to function. That is to say, for example, if a worker and a capitalist are both involved cooperatively in the production of a commodity, uh, the, the worker has a stake in emphasizing how much of the value in that commodity the worker produced, and the capitalist has a stake in emphasizing how much of the value the capitalist him or herself produced. So it's this is not a matter of objective fact, it's a matter of disagreement. And social life is fighting over what the real value of a thing is. And, you know, in some ways, I just summarize Marx's argument in Capital about the value of commodities, a very influential argument that, uh, that the, uh, he feels that it is an, an African-like form of foolishness. And that's what he implies by using the term fetishism, that Capitalists and many people in capitalist society believe that a commodity has an intrinsic value, that when it's sold, it's perfectly reasonable for most of the sales price to go to the capitalist because it looks as though the value of that object came out of thin air just through its, uh, its utility to people and the fact that it's owned by the capitalist. Whereas Marx argued, on the contrary, that, um, that and I'll summarize this argument, that the value of a commodity or a manufacturer or anything that's made for sale is determined exclusively by the amount of time that the workers spent collectively making it. Therefore, the entire sales value rightfully belongs to the worker. 
And again, he dismisses the capitalist pretense that the, the owner of capital, the capitalist, really deserves that value uh, by analogizing the capitalist to an African fetishist. Uh, he, is, uh, he or she is just uh, is denying the real value of the object, the real source of that value, and the, the, the real agency that produced that object. And my position is that um, I, I'm sympathetic to that position. Workers cer certainly deserve, uh, deserve uh, a fair wage and a fair living wage for their contribution to that manufacture. But Marx's argument was specifically a defense of the rights of white European industrial workers. His argument included an explicit assertion that the enslaved workers who produced, for example, a large amount of the cotton that was being processed in European industrial factories were inefficient, lazy, because they were owned and would always be fed. Uh, they didn't have an incentive, by his argument, to acquire skills or produce efficiently. And therefore, um, the European wage slave is the real producer of value and the person who has really been inappropriately ripped off by this system. And by contrast, he thinks that the, he argued that the injustice done to the slave is, is merely a pedestal for the illustration of the suffering and the highly efficient productivity of the European wage worker. Now, generation upon generation of Marxist scholars who have praised as genius Marx's theory of the fetishism of commodities, as far as I know, have never noticed this, this uh, deeply uh, uh, uneven distribution of empathy that Marx directed toward black workers as opposed to white workers. But literally, he claims that the suffering of the wage slave is greater than that of the slave. He, he cast the European wage worker as the real avant-garde and the person truly worthy of the dictatorship of the proletariat that will issue in a, a, a world of justice that is socialism and communism, but ignores the revolutionary efforts of the enslaved Africans that came even before any socialist revolution in Europe, namely the Haitian Revolution. And it seems to me this uneven assignment of agency and value to workers of different colors is rooted in Marx's own biographical experience. He himself was a European trained lawyer who couldn't practice in Prussia because he offended the monarch with his social critiques. And then he ended up being part of the German labor diaspora that was in England, in London, among other places. And he earned his wage by selling newspaper articles to North American uh, newspapers. And, um, and so his defense of a class of people that he resembled was at the root of his theory of the fetishism of commodities. And it shifted agency, credit, and value from black workers to white workers. So the usual pretense to answer your question is that European social theory was generated by these geniuses who just came up with their ideas out of thin air. But my argument is that uh, both religions and European social theories are generated by real human beings with real material interests who regularly refer to objects and images of objects and credit those objects with value and agency in ways that are biased by their own social condition and their own aspirations. Does that render fetishism unusable as, as a methodology, this problematic context from whence it came? I hope not. Um, I'm very hesitant to well see, first of all, my effort as an anthropologist is to employ this term fetishism to illuminate what I think is a universal social phenomenon. And that is uh, uh, um, trade partners, social interlocutors, people at different ranks within any given social system uh, regularly have as a touchstone of their relationship certain objects and the control over certain objects, whether it's the control over land, the control over cash, the control over commodities, the control over a church building or what have you. And they have rival images, they assert rival images of what the worth of that object is and who deserves credit for that, for, for that 
object and its worth, and who deserves to control that object and its worth. I think social life is inherently a competitive debate over the value, agency, and control over objects. Um, and, uh, and yet, dominant parties regularly get to call the, uh, the ideas of subordinate parties fetishism in ways that subordinated parties don't get to call the, the ways of thinking of dominant parties fetishism. But to my mind, they're equally forms of fetishism insofar as people um, shift credit for the value of an object from one person to another in self-interested ways. And I'd like to alert people to how this happens in all sorts of relationships. Um, uh, yet, this object is usually targeted at the most vulnerable populations. So, for example, um, African sacred objects were long called fetishes as a way of justifying African people's enslavement and of, uh, of, of denying black people participation in the forms of democracy that the European bourgeoisie felt it was worthy of on the grounds of their allegedly not being fetishists. Um, that is to say, um, the, the Enlightenment and the democracies that emerged from the thinking it generated were arguments that the European bourgeoisie deserved the same rights as the European aristocracy. And Hegel's early writing, for example, argued that the slave is more fully conscious and more enlightened than the master is because the, the enslaved has to understand the perspectives of the two parties in the interaction, whereas the master has to understand only his or her own perspective. And yet, after the Haitian Revolution, when Africans really exemplified this advanced consciousness, this effort to advance justice, and yet as a, as a result of, of the French imposing enormous indemnities upon Haiti, Haiti degenerated into a dictatorship. So it seems to me that Hegel argued in his subsequent work that the difference between uh, bourgeois Germans, that is non-aristocratic, non-royal Germans, and Africans who advocated for a more democratic form of rule was that Africans are fetishists. And this was a way of saying, wait, the European aristocracy, Europe does not have to worry that the bourgeoisie will make a mess once it gets equal rights because we're different from those Africans. But, you know, of course, we know that Germans generation after generation made a mess of democracy. I mean, culminating in, in, in the rise of the Nazis, democracy is not an easy thing to execute any place in the world. Social equality is not easy to institute any place in the world. It's no different in Europe from in Africa. But my point being that, um, that the, the argument that somebody is practicing fetishism is usually not an even-handed criticism. And I would like to point out the hypocrisy with which some people assert their superiority to others to the shifting of the value and agency of objects. This is something, it seems to me, all of us do, and I'd like us to be aware of that. Yet, I hesitate to use it because, um, for example, um, uh, museums of African art have worked very, very hard to reclassify African sacred objects as art, equivalent in quality, in, uh, in their culturally educational value and worth to the European objects called art. And the thing they fear the greatest is a resurrection of the tendency to call these objects fetishes with the implication that they lack worth and that the people who produce them are somehow less worthy than Europeans are. So uh, again, I, I, I am always hesitant to use the term fetishism, even heuristically, even as I explain the even-handed manner in which I want it to be applied, because it has so long been used and it so automatically triggers Western European ideas about the inherent superiority of post-Enlightenment thinking and its prototypical bearers, that is, white men, and, and the, the unworthiness of people of color. Um, and that contrasting evaluation of human beings is deeply embedded in, in Marxist thought. It's deeply embedded in Freudian thought as well. Um, for me, a major touchstone of Freud's thinking 
uh, about the fetish is his writing in Totem and Taboo, in which he, he asserts very loudly as an assimilated European Jewish man, we Europeans think this way and that way, unlike those savages, and the savages he was describing were black and brown people, but chiefly black people to whom Jewish people in Europe had regularly been compared by anti-Semites. But he was clarifying his position in a global colonial hierarchy by speaking in the voice of we non-fetishists who really think the right way. And this was at a time, mind you, when lynching was at its height, and the kinds of fetishism he was describing were the inappropriate assignment of sexual value to objects. That is to say, he observed a number of large number of European men and women who were deeply aroused by objects like fur hats, boots, noses, garters, and so forth. Whereas he thought the normal object of sexual attraction and the normal objects of arousal should be a woman's genitals. He was speaking from a male point of view. Um, from his normative point of view, anyone who was attracted to uh, a boot or was aroused by a fur hat or by the glint of a woman's nose or, or a garter was somehow uh, um, uh, looking away from the proper object of sexual attraction. It was therefore a fetish. He argued that the source of fetishism was this you know, weird theory that some of your readers will have heard of, and I'm not sure if it's worthy of going into full detail, but he had this theory that, the, the, that every boy, at some age between age one and age five, when he notices that his mother does not have a penis, understands his mother to lack a penis, and infers that she lacks that penis because the father cut it off. That as a result of some infraction on his part, if, if he refused to accept the father's authority, he too may be subjected to castration. So great was the fear he experienced, this boy, of castration, that he decided that he would renounce his efforts to keep possession of the mother, obey the order of the father, and wait for the day when he himself, with his penis, could be the master of a woman. And he felt that the boys who were too traumatized by this sight of a penisless crotch on their mother were thereafter afraid of that crotch, and they displaced their fear. That is, they, they, they did not want to face the fear of castration, so they displaced their memory of that moment of seeing the penisless crotch of their mother onto the object that they had seen just a moment before. It became a source of arousal that became necessary in their sex lives subsequently. This is Freud's theory about why some people are, in his view, inordinately aroused by a high-heeled shoe or a garter or a fur hat or what have you. Um, and uh, and he, he argued that this uh, phenomenon among neurotic Europeans was very much like the projections that, chil that European children uh, make uh, and very much like the inappropriate attribution of sacred value that uh, that Africans direct toward their sacred objects. Hence, he described this as fetishism. Now, um, this foolish theory, what, what to me is a very foolish theory, it just, it just doesn't ring true in so many ways, but in some ways it does ring true. That is, he said the most exciting of fetishes are objects and actions that embody both the fear that one will be castrated, that one will be oppressed, that one will be harmed, that one will be punished, and the, 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 the actor's identification with the oppressor, with the potential castrator. So the boy's identification both as a potential victim of castration and as a future potential castrator. So one of the examples he gave was of the example of uh, Les Coupeurs des Nattes, the cutter. It was a man who was tremendously aroused by sneaking up on a, on a sleeping woman and cutting off her braid, 
which enacted the castration, but it also recalled the boy's fear of being castrated himself in a hidden, controlled, sublimated way. So Freud, in his article on fetishism in 1927, said the most exciting of fetishes are objects that embody these contrary positions, these contrary positionalities and perspectives within the actor, him or herself, especially himself. And I find that a fascinating basis to think about which objects are most exciting to contemporary Westerners and to religious people generally. Take the cross, for example, which is literally an instrument of torture and murder, but also an instrument of great hope. It is an identification with the God of giving one's self up for a sacrifice, but also a promise that that sacrifice will actually be compensated for by enormous riches and comfort. Um, and it seems to me that lots of gods embody these, and, and sacred objects embody these ex extreme and contrary sentiments. That is, the threat that it will punish you unreasonably and, and, and extremely, but also that it will elevate you beyond your greatest dreams to luxury and comfort and punish your enemies in these ruthless ways. And, and again, you know, not only sacred objects and the God image itself, but some of the populist politicians of today embody this logic of fetishism. They, they, they promise extremes of, they promise to aggrandize their followers, but they also engage in extreme forms of cruelty that the followers must know that they're vulnerable to at the same time. And that's exciting to a lot of people. Um, so anyhow, I've rattled on long enough. What do you think? Well, I think that that's a perfect segue to uh, what you're working on at the moment because you just brought up the topic of uh, populism. And your current project, I understand that you're working on at the moment, um, is about white American BDSM yeah. as an Afro-Atlantic spiritual practice yeah. and the implications for our current populist movement. So if we could just spend a few minutes on that because I think it sounds fascinating. Very good. Okay. Let me touch on something that's relevant to this topic I didn't mention before, and that is the concept of ethnological schadenfreude. It helps me understand the genius of Marx and Freud as assimilated European Jewish men at detecting the ambivalence in, their, in, in, in symbols. That is to say that they had the option to ascend into European Western white maleness, but they were also vulnerable to being cast with the rest of us who are black and female into the most oppressed of states. So they themselves could theorize and 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 uh, create fetishes of extraordinary persuasiveness. Um, the, their fetishes, including you know the, their very theories, but also the objects that they use to illustrate these theories: the straight back couch, the straight back chair, and the couch. Freud's, uh, Freud's artifact collection, um, Freud's cigar, uh, Marx's factory, and, and the, the overcoat that he repeatedly referred to in Capital as, as simultaneously the object of, of, of uh, let's see, an embodiment of personal history and as a totally impersonal object of sale. Um, so my, my thought inspired as, as much, well, primarily by my observation of the self representation of immigrants of African descent in the United States relative to African Americans is that populations that can possibly construct themselves, populations that are vulnerable to oppression, often try to construct some third party as even more appropriately oppressed to highlight their difference from that third party. I think that's what Marx and Freud were doing as they labeled Africans uh, uh, fetishists and and degraded the skills and productivity of the of African American enslaved people, even though African American enslaved people were fantastically productive. They created the wealth of this country, and at the at the time of the abolition of slavery, sorry to digress a bit, they were far and away the most valuable property in the United States because of their productivity. So basically. Marx was propagating an anti-abolitionist lie in the service of the European worker. Anyhow, back to ethnological schadenfreude. Um, it seems to me that uh, that that uh, 
rank and the worry about decline and rank are key sentiments in the current populist moment. Um, now, as for BDSM in particular, um, I'll tell a brief story if you don't mind. Much of the, 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 the thought that I just <clears throat> summarized was already in my head when in 2015 I was invited out to Ohio State University to discuss the manuscript with a group of Marxist and, and psycho, psychoanalytical scholars there. And as my wife, as uh, you know, before the evening discussion, my wife and I decided to take a walk through Columbus, which is a university town, because you know there's this genre of town in the United States that you know where there's a university and a whole bunch of you know stores that serve students. They're sort of cosmopolitan, but they're sort of cookie cutter, and we just find them interesting. So we decided we we're going to walk down the street, and um, we were warned by a, a, a young university student who who was an attendant at our hotel desk, you know, be careful as you walk up that street, there's a kind of sketchy part of the street. And I know what he meant by that was poor and black. And, you know, that's not how we thought of the neighborhood, but that's how a lot of white Americans think of neighborhoods. So we walk up the street and just at the edge of this poor, poor this so-called sketchy neighborhood, we found this shop who, that had a sign on the front that said the chamber Ohio's largest fetish store. And I realized, oh my God, immersed in European social theory and African religions as I am, I had forgotten that for white Americans and for lots of Western Europeans, and I suspect for Australians too, the term fetishism first brings to mind um, outlying sexual practices uh, in which people dressed up in a distinctive kind of clothing engage in sexual relations that are at once titillating and frightening. And so my wife and I walk into the store and we got the story from the horse's mouth. I had never thought about it much, but a woman named Queen Alicia introduced me to the idea <clears throat> that there are more than a few people in this university town. And we discovered as we drove back to North Carolina through West Virginia, that there were more than a few people in West Virginia too who configure their, uh, the most exciting parts of their sexual lives around the mimesis of slavery. That is to say, in a momentary encounter or a long-term relationship, one of the partners understands him or herself to be a dom, that is a dominant, or a slave, and the other party understands him or herself to be a sub, a bottom, or a slave. And the typical uniform of these practices is black leather, which, you know, to, to put it briefly, looks like donning the skin of black people. Um, they, they use props that are drawn from the practices of slavery, such as whips, chains, gags. Um, the opposite of these sexual practices or erotic practices is called vanilla which in the United States is an explicit reference to the banality of white suburban life. And for us, the suburbs are outlying areas where, fam where you know, white people get to raise their families in, in financially and physically protected ways and, and uh, government subsidized ways. But it's con it was considered very ordinary uh, <clears throat> uh, at the time when, uh, when at the time that this contrast between fetishism and vanilla sex has emerged. And, of course, the term fetish itself harkens back to a long Afro-Atlantic history of Europeans trying to define themselves as worthy of democracy by contrasting themselves to Africans. And yet there is a significant number of pretty highly educated and pretty powerful uh, Western people who... Uh, literally fantasize about enacting the role of the enslaved. That is to say, these practices, BDSM, is typically not intent, as you know, the public image would suggest, on some one person bullying somebody else, like the Marquis de Sade would just you know take advantage of women against their will. That's not what it is these days. What it is these days is uh, people who regularly have a lot of power in daily life. Who occupy very lofty social positions, judges, lawyers, doctors, Silicon Valley uh, executives, uh, 
who enter a particular space that's reserved for this. And mostly these very powerful people want to be the slaves and the subs in those nighttime interactions. They, during the day, they feel so under pressure to be responsible, to take care of everything, to make decisions all the time, that they relish the idea of having somebody else take total control and put themselves into uh, uh, risky situations in which somebody else is making all of the decisions. So almost to the same degree that the subs and slaves in these ritual spaces or erotic spaces called dungeons are in daily life dominant parties, the dominant parties in the dungeon are typically people who in daily or vanilla life don't have many opportunities to assert authority. And so it's, it, it's, it struck me as a really, really important lesson to me about the ambivalence of some very powerful Westerners to Enlightenment ideas of political equality and democracy among white people not only in BDSM, but in what remains of Western religion and, what, and, and in much of Western romantic life, there is a fantasy of hierarchy that reaches an extreme in the world of BDSM or bondage, discipline, dominant submission, sadomasochism. But that extreme alerts me to the irony that so many people, you know, not only in Eastern Europe that, you know, just, you know, escape from the Soviet bloc and had the potential to build these wonderful democracies, but all over the democratic world, there are these people who, you know, these white middle-class people who vocally cherish the idea of one person, one vote, uh, who are also willing to exclude brown people from such democracy, but who among themselves wish to mime the role of that brown person or black person who is absolutely subordinated. For some of them, it looks like paradise, looks like an erotic thrill to be dominated. And some of the psychology may be that, you know, people who are dominant in these systems feel guilty. They relish being punished a bit for their inordinate privilege, their unearned, unfair privileges. But some of it is that is imposter syndrome. A lot of highly dominant white men who are expected by the cultural model always to know what they're doing, always to be like Superman, no matter what the, the, the adversity, they always know exactly what to do. And they're, they always need to be in charge. This is not a comfortable role for any human being. And it reminds me of the, that story by George Orwell about shooting, shooting an elephant. Have you ever read that story? Uh, no, I haven't actually. Oh, it's a story in which um, a junior officer, uh, British officer in colonial Burma, is the only white man in the village when an elephant runs amok. And, you know, all the people in Burma know occasionally an elephant runs amok, but it's such a valuable creature, you don't just go and shoot it. <laughs> you, you figure out a way of working around his, his must, his, you know, period of must. But... A lot of villagers run up to this white man and say, you got to do something. You got to do something. You're in charge. And he didn't know anything about the situation. He didn't know what to do. So he took the most rash decision possible because he felt he had to make a decision to save face among all of these people who expected him to be decisive. And he shot this animal. He killed this animal. And then afterwards, they said to him, why did you do that? That, that was an extremely valuable animal. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, know from experience as a college, as a formal U.S. American college student, but also as a college professor that teaching at very elite universities, that virtually every student who gets into these institutions thinks he or she is an imposter. And I sat on fa in faculty meetings with like old white men who'd been professors at Harvard for 40 years when I'd been a professor for 10, 20, 20 years. And sometimes, you know, we would have discussed something at a prior faculty meeting where I think decision X was made. And then suddenly at the next faculty meeting, the dean announces a totally different 
decision as though we had all made a totally different decision. And I turned to one of these older white men, you know, 20 years my senior, you know, some of them had been my professors because I was a Harvard undergraduate. I'd say, what happened? And they would turn to me and say, I don't know. I've been here for 40 years and sometimes I still don't know what's going on. And so I wasn't the only one who felt lost and embarrassed that I didn't understand what they were doing. And yet these white men had to pretend they knew. And until I turned to them and said, what's going on? That they, had, they didn't even have the courage to question it themselves. So in any case, I'm trying to figure out the psychology by which the people who have been most privileged by the ideology of individuality and political equality among white people can find in their erotic and religious lives and even their political lives something very attractive about hierarchy and even about subordinating, them, subordinating themselves in that hierarchy. My goodness me, um, you've really kind of blown my mind with that last section there on the concept of, of, of BDSM and, and hierarchy and just I, I, I can't wait to see where this, this work goes and maybe we could have you back um, right. on the project for just a whole episode on that because I just, you've really yep. sort of shifted my thinking there. So thank you so much for that. You're and welcome. we have to wrap up now. So I just wanted to thank you for joining us today and, and sharing your, you know, your past work and your present work with us and uh, yeah, stay safe with everything that's going on at the moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Fallon. Now, I'm sure that your mind is buzzing after that episode. And rather than hearing Dave and I natter about it, we'd rather hear from you. We'd rather hear from you on Facebook, Twitter, and our other socials. So, Dave, how do our listeners tell us what they thought about that episode? We love it when our listeners join us on our website, which is religiousstudiesproject.com, where you can listen to the episode and find responses that are going to be in later this week to the episode. We love it when you join us on Facebook and find our social media editor, Ray Radford, posting on Facebook, where you can interact with us and share the link with all of your friends. We really appreciate it. When you join us on Twitter, where we're the most active out of all of these things, and we are Project RS on Twitter. And we love it if you would come and share and retweet and comment on things. We think that that's just the best. And if you think it's the best and you're really enjoying the work that we're doing, we would really appreciate your financial support, keeping the podcast going and making sure that we pay for transcripts and hosting costs. These are the business side of doing podcasts. And we like to take seriously the obligation that we have to try to reduce the amount of unpaid labor that's going on in the academy. So if you can go over to our uh, Patreon page, which is uh, patreon.com slash project RS, even a few dollars a month, a cup of coffee uh, for the editors really adds up and it allows us to fund graduate students to help us get the transcriptions done. It allows us to fund um, new work on the website and to really make the, the product that we offer you for free every week uh, even better and to support uh, those of you that might want to use it in the classroom and then share it with everybody online. We always appreciate you coming onto our socials and sharing what we do and the love that we have for religious studies with um, everyone else. And I think until the next time, when we have a current events discourse episode coming up the next time, so secret topic, until then, all that's left to say is, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. The RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. 
Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash projectrs and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals. <laughs>